Good evening. Psalm 62, verses 5 and 6 say, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. Good reminder for us, from whence cometh our help. Now let's pray to our help this evening. Lord, may our hearts, may our minds be at one with the psalmist tonight, for it is you alone who is worth waiting for. You are the only one who can be the balm to a soul, the hope to a soul, the salvation for a soul. You are our fortress, and because of that, we can say with the psalmist, we shall not be shaken as well. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, again, good evening. Welcome to our evening service here at OB Evangelical Free Church. And if you're watching our recording online, a welcome to you, but we would love to see you in person if you're nearby. Amen. Let's again come to the Lord in prayer as we come to his word. Lord, you are our true and living hope. As we come to you now, we desire to sit under your word rather than over your word in judgment as if we could exercise such a judgment over your timeless and true word. We wish to sit under it, submitted to it. We wish to sit under it, yielded to it. And we wish to sit under it, to hear it, to hear it with the faith that you've given us, blessed us with, graced us with, a faith that at once can Uh, Repent of our sins because you are trustworthy to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, but yet also a a faith to receive your ongoing work of of grace and salvation in our lives. To that end, we thank you for this word and what it is and what it can be in us, and we pray that we would be not just hearers but doers of it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So as I said, we're continuing our series called Scenes of Hope. My hope is that this is the penultimate uh, sermon, but we'll see how that goes. My plan is to finish off next week. Uh, We've covered quite a large spectrum. It started because our motto verse, do you remember our motto verse? Well, surely hope is in it, right? Because we've been in hope since uh, the beginning of January. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's Romans 15, 13. And we made a particular note out of that verse and in just speaking and thinking about hope that there was a nature to biblical hope that is quite different, of course, than the common way in which we think of hope. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It is a confident expectation of good things. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says it this way, that we can be a full assurance in hope. There's a full assurance of hope. That's Hebrews 6, uh, verse 11. And we've covered a number of things, have we not? I think it's nine or 10, possibly this is the 10th uh, in the series. We've looked at hope for our deepest need. We've looked at hope for the outcast, hope for the desperate, hope for the lost, hope for the weary, hope for the brokenhearted, hope for the non-religious, hope for the unclean, and hope for the anxious. A lot of those are in a way, how do we sustain a life of hope in Christian faith? In these last two weeks, I think I want to focus a little bit more on maybe something a little bit more broad. That doesn't mean it won't be have good application, but maybe in the classic sense of what Christian hope is. Peter, you might remember from his letter that we studied uh, about a year or more ago, he speaks of hope as being a living hope, a future inheritance that's kept and guarded 
in heaven for us. So that sense of something that the Lord has for us that we can have a confident expectation toward. That's, I think, the classic definition of Christian hope. And of course, ultimately, that's our salvation in and through Christ. Well, tonight, the text that we go to is found in Titus. You can turn with me to Titus. You'll find that after the pastoral epistles to Timothy 1 and 2. Titus 2, and I'm reading verses 11 to 14, and this is uh, from the English Standard Version. And as always, this is God's word. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave us for, him, for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Well, I happen to think this is uh, one of the best little texts that we have to cover such um, a wide expanse, really, of the Christian faith. We can see it, it, it deals with uh, beginnings and middles and endings, does it not? How we come to faith in Christ, how are we to live out our life of faith in Christ, and then what are we heading toward because of that life of faith in Christ? It's a wonderful text, even though it's only four verses. In fact, in short order, I think I probably had four different outlines that would have been equally valid to give as a sermon uh, this evening, although maybe not this evening. What shaped this evening's in terms of its structure and what I'm aiming to do tonight is, of course, our series on hope. That's really what's guiding me through this, but I acknowledge what a wonderful text this is. It would be a great text to sit with somebody that you're trying to evangelize with and explain the Christian faith to. It's a good discipleship text for those who are already Christians, and it's a great text for those who have been Christians even for six or seven decades, because it does minister hope, I think, to our hearts. So let's dig in and see what we see. As I said, I think it is the very heart and soul of the Christian faith, this text from verses 11 to 14, partly because it says with great simplicity that God saves men from sin. It presents God as a savior. I think that's, in a way, the main point of the text. It reminds us that the very purpose of the coming of Christ, as well as the very purpose for our Christian lives in the world, is to demonstrate that God is indeed a saving God, and that saving makes a difference to us. It's not just saving us from something, but it's saving us to something in how we live, and towards something in terms of where we are going. The saving power of God. The simple message, really, of the Christian faith is that God saves men from sins. It's the message of the Christian faith. It's the message, then, of the church. It's the message, we hope, of every mission partner that we have or evangelist that we set out. It ought to be the message that's on our lips as well, a message of hope to those whom we know and love, that God is a God who saves. He came to seek and save the lost. Remember that from our little study in Zacchaeus. 1 Timothy 2 says, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It's the heart of God, and so I think in this passage, we get a little glimpse of the heart of God. Particularly though tonight, I wanna to ask that question of how imperfect humans like you and like me can have such a confident expectation that God would give us good things. Have you ever wondered in life when everything seems to go against you, can I have good things? <laughs> 
It can feel like that at times. But let me tell you, God is the giver of good things. Let's look at this passage again. How does it help us see, I think two things, the nature of God's hope, but also the reality of God's hope. And then in doing so, I hope that this would encourage us to, of course, live in hope. Well, point one is that we have a blessed hope. That's right in the middle of the passage. Look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope is a blessed hope. Now that's good news if it's not surprising news. Our hope isn't a cursed hope, it's a blessed hope. Blessed here meaning beneficial to us. Even happy is not a bad translation for it, a happy, beneficial hope. I said it's not surprising because it's in line with the character of God. Is it not that he would give good things? I think it's Matthew in Matthew's gospel who records that um, Jesus saying, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father would give good gifts. Every good and perfect gift, the Bible tells us, comes from God. On the more theological side, Romans, uh, Paul wrote uh, Romans, of course, and in chapter 8, verse 1, he tells us that there's no condemnation for those who are found in Christ. So again, why would we anticipate that something that is pitched as hope for God's people would be anything but a blessed hope, a happy hope, a beneficial hope? His return will be nothing but a blessing. The Bible also tells us that no eye has seen, that no ear has heard, not even entered into the imagination of men. My wife likes to fancy her imagination, but nothing that she's imagined, anything that she could imagine in terms of our hope and glory would pale in comparison to the reality. That's a great promise that we have from God. Besides that, the text here tells us that it's not merely blessed, but it's glorious. A word, when you think about it, is reserved for God himself. He's jealous for his own glory. He shielded all of the people of God, and through all eternity has shielded the people of God from the fullness of his glory. And yet, in some way, when we see our blessed hope, his glory will appear. His glory will appear. What a wonder that will be. We see his title here, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This highlights, of course, who he is and what he's done. But I think what is particularly noteworthy about this appearing is that, again, it will be in his full glory. We will see his glory. And so I would say from this that we'll be blessed even beyond measure when we see Christ for his glory, even in practical ways. When you think of when you see Christ in eternity, it will also mean that this life is over. The trials of this life, the challenges of this life, the illnesses of this life, the, the disappointments of this life. Now, I'm basically a half full, glass half full person. I'm not an escapist. I'm not looking to leave this life just for the life to come. Because I, I, I love life. I really do. And I think there's so much to appreciate in God's natural world and in the relationships he has, the responsibilities he blesses us with. And yet, this is as close to hell as I'll ever get, living this life. Because the taste of what is to come, I can't even imagine. I'm not an escapist, but I do believe what Paul said again in Romans chapter 8. He said, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's a remarkable thing. 
not even just to us, but in us. There is coming an absolute new and precious reality, something that we can't even imagine. As we struggle day by day, when we struggle to pull ourselves into prayer, or we struggle to pull ourselves away from sin or temptation, we can't even imagine having that kind of glory on the inside of us. But this is the great promise of God, blessed absolutely beyond measure. Again, Paul to the Romans said, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Doesn't put us to shame. So we're not going to be caught disappointed or in shame because that which we hope for has fallen so far short. God will honor this great promise. So this blessed hope is a joyful, confident assurance that God will bring to full fruit our salvation and all of its blessed benefits. Note the title again, Great God and Savior. This is another aspect of the blessing. He's not judge to us. At that point, even though surely he is the judge of all the world, all that is, he is the lens through which all will be judged as either truth or error. But for us, for those that are in Christ, he is savior, not judge. So that's what we are saved toward. Our destiny, our destiny is God's glory, not God's wrath. And that's a wonder. I was thinking, um, you know, even as I'm trying to put some shape to this word blessed, how futile it is. And, you know, even the greatest of poets couldn't wax poetically enough to paint a picture for us that would be vivid enough or truthful enough for what this blessing will be like. Um, the book of Revelation, I think, is a wonderful book, and, and the Bible tells us we're blessed if we read it and give ourselves to it. Sadly, it's not seen often for what it actually is. We have to go look no further than the title, and I really like the fact the ESV titles it in the way they do. They say it is the revelation to John. It's not a roadmap for how to read your newspaper. It is a revelation to John of Jesus Christ. That is what revelation is. Read 1-1 one, one with me, or you don't need to turn there, I'll read it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So John had this revelation, a divine revelation of the coming Christ. And he did his best to put pen to paper, as it were, or quill to papyri, whatever he did. And we have a record of what he said. But even this, I think, is the struggle of a human to put into human words that which he sees in this grand and glorious vision. Verse 12 of chapter 1 says this, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, the hairs of his head were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice, his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. When I saw him, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. He's trying to explain the vision for a church that he loves, for a church that he has spent his life, um, you know, living through tremendous persecutions. And he wants to encourage the church. This is what's coming. This is a taste, the best I can manage in terms of the vision of the wonders of our Savior. You know, I think of um, Lance last uh, Wednesday handled our communion and he was speaking about the, the men 
on their way traversing to Emmaus. And they said of that strange visitor that came alongside the road, alongside the journey, and was explaining the scriptures to them. Did not our hearts burn within us? Did not our hearts burn within us? If, if that's what they felt in his presence on this side of eternity, how much more will we have wonder and glory forevermore? Our hearts will surely be on fire. His light so pure, so stunning that we will not need a sun, so satisfying, will not experience in heaven a single tear. No matter the trial or tragedy in this life, so all satisfying is he that there's no room for sadness. He is a blessed, blessed, blessed hope. But the second point is that he's also a visible hope. He's a visible hope. Do we know that there are two appearances in this little text? And that's why I started in the center, because they're on opposite sides of our blessed hope. We see the appearance of glory, but we also see the appearance of grace. And I think by choosing to frame this in this fashion, Paul is speaking, yes, to the, the nature of hope, its blessedness, but also to its reality, its tangibility. It's something that we can see, it's something we can witness, it's something we can experience. Visibility, I think, suits the human soul as well. This has been a human hope for any that have really longed for God, who've had the conviction of the Spirit rest upon them such that they knew they had to be different. The human hope, the human longing is and has been to see the Christ. Think of his birth. At his birth, the shepherds, what did they say to another? Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing. They had to see the Christ. The Magi wanted to see him and worship him. Simeon, dear Simeon, my eyes have now seen your salvation. I can leave this world in peace. Philip said to Nathaniel, come and see. Zacchaeus climbed the sycamore tree so he could see. The woman at the well said, come and see a man who told me all I ever did. Could he be the Christ? Even the Greeks came to uh, Philip and said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. <clears throat> and Paul, the great Theologian and apostle said, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, now we know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. This glorious reappearing, as John says, we shall see him as he is, and we will be like him. But for now, we're waiting. We're waiting for this blessed hope. And what does our waiting look like besides confident expectation? Well, in verse 12, for instance, it's people who renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. We're to put off godliness and put on godliness while we wait. We live for his glory lives aiming to please him rather than ourselves or others but where does the power come from to live such a life where does the motivation come to live such a life consecrated unto the lord where does the patience come from to wait for this blessed hope well that's why paul puts our blessed hope where he does in between the appearing of grace and the appearing of glory I think for good reason, because then we can look back in gratitude to the appearing of grace, yet also look forward to the appearing of glory. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 9, I think, really balances these two elements of the appearing of Christ, the first appearing and the second appearing. This is 9, if you're taking notes, verses 27 and 28. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, 
And after that comes judgment. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for them, for him. So that first coming was about settling that sin question for those who would take not a leap of faith, actually, but a, a, an exercise of faith that's based on the evidence of his appearing. The word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. And for those that would dare trust for the forgiveness of their sins and someone else rather than themselves, rather than pulling themselves up out of the miry clay or some other false god or hope, those that would indeed trust in Christ, then for the second coming have had the sin question dealt away with. And they are merely appearing or looking for the appearing of the glory of Christ, the fullness of their salvation. This isn't to imply that there's a two-stage sort of salvation, that you're, you're, you're saved but can't really be sure of it. No, the Bible is really clear that we can be sure of our salvation, but it's also clear that we haven't seen the fullness of its benefit. There are ways in which we get glimpses of this Savior, glimpses of his glory, but not the fullness of his glory. Fullness of his blessings are to come. But we need this grace before we get to the glory. It's the importance of grace even in our waiting, I think, besides the link to glory. What is grace? Well, it's not the same as mercy. Sometimes it's used interchangeably, but it, it's not. It's not, uh, mercy would be not getting what you deserve versus grace, which is getting what we don't deserve or have not earned. It's one element, certainly. Grace is also something that's empowering. Here we can see, actually, uh, verse 12, it says it's something that's a discipling element to our lives. It trains us. Some definitions of grace that I've come across just this past week have been helpful. I found them helpful. Um, Babing says it's his voluntary, unrestrained, unmerited favor toward guilty sinners, granting them justification and life instead of the penalty of death, which they deserve. That's grace. Louis Burkhoff defined it as the free giving of kindness on one who has no claim to it. J.I. Packer put it this way, the Grace of God is love freely shown towards guilty sinners, contrary to their merit, and indeed in defiance of their demerit. Meaning, actually, not only are you getting what you didn't deserve, you're not getting what you absolutely do deserve. It's God showing goodness to persons who deserve only severity. But actually really settled on maybe not settled, but one I appreciated that I hadn't seen before was Alexander McLaren saying that grace is God's self-originating love. It's a lovely definition, I think. He talks about it being self-motived. What do I mean by that? Or what does he mean by that? It's a grace that has uh, no motive but itself, no motive but its own inclination towards his creation. So again, it, it emphasizes that we don't earn that love. We don't earn that grace. It is his self-motivation. Out of that self-motivation, he bestows grace. He bestows love. It's a compassionate grace. It's a, a bending low grace. He's, he used the word stoop. It's an older word to stoop low because it's a love that reaches something so much lower than itself. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. This is the first revelation, the first appearing, as it were, of Jesus the Christ, the one who manifests this self-motived, self-originated, loving grace. 
And so we need this grace. There's no experienced glory without experienced grace. John put it this way in his opening to his gospel. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This melding of both grace and glory. And this is because at Christmas we don't celebrate merely the birth of a man, but the incarnation of God himself. And the grace that brings salvation to all men has appeared. And with this appearing grace, then we're no longer merely longing to see. We're no longer groping in the dark, searching in vain. Paul would speak of the Greek philosophers and poets, for instance, writing poetically about an unknown God. No, we do not look for him in nature. We don't seek him in the depths of even human hearts and their ambitions and hopes. This religion, this God, this true God is not made with human hands, nor is it conceived with human thought. It's the one that we have seen, the one that has appeared. We know from historic fact, the word made flesh who dwelt among us, our Emmanuel, God with us, the hope of glory. And so this grace has appeared. And we hear him say, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. So in our in-between state, this waiting for the blessed grace, and then aside of that, the verses 12 and 14 that describe the aim and effect of God's grace as it appeared in the first coming. Sandwiching this blessed hope that we would be a people that are devoted to the good works of God, devoted to, to him and not to ourselves and our pleasures. But God's grace has begun in our lives through that first coming. He will complete in our lives through the second coming if we wait faithfully for that blessed hope. And so I think what this tells us in total that yes, we have this incredible, blessed hope, but that Christianity is not wish fulfillment. It's, it's not an invention of the heart to soften the pain of loss. It's not an invention of one's mind to satisfy religious philosophers. It's the revelation of God to man, hope for the hopeless. We have a hope that has appeared, appeared in grace, in the revelation of himself to us, and he will appear again, our sure and living hope. We have a blessed hope. We have a glorious hope. We have indeed a perfect hope, but a hope for which we must wait. Hope that is sure, hope that has appeared, a visible hope founded on the reality of this saving grace. The grace of God has appeared. The glory of God is to appear. And the appearance of that glory is that blessed hope. And we thank God for the discipling even of his grace, which prepares our hearts for the fullness, for the expectation of this uh, glory. Let's pray. God, indeed, no eye has seen, no ear has heard the things you have prepared for us. And yet, in your love and in your kindness, and you have deemed to explain it in ways that certainly tell us of its wonders. And so we wait with a confident expectation because we have seen. We look back in gratefulness toward your, toward your grace, but we look with anticipation to the wonders of your glory as well all of this motivating us now to serve out of gratefulness and sure hope we pray this and we thank you for it in christ's name amen amen <clears throat> Benedict
benediction tonight is from Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. So go in his peace, you are loved.